I think everybody that works at the SEC Network and ESPN <laughs> that we deal with are just good people. Marty Smith joining us here on the Boss Firearms Hotline. What's up, Marty? Good morning, brother. I appreciate you saying that. I hope y'all are doing well down there. I can't imagine 110. How hot is it? It's been raining quite a bit, actually. It's probably, what, Cali, 90s? Or, yeah, no? yesterday it was like 85 at 5 or yeah. 4 in the afternoon. So. Not too bad. Well, 85 and 88% humidity. <laughs> That, uh, you know, that feels like the feels like graphic on your weather app feels like 110. It does. It does. Hey, so I barely <laughs> saw you. In, I like the setup in Dallas, but where we were, we're at the very end. So I didn't get to see you very much. We saw each other when we both checked in and that was basically it. I didn't see you again. That was it. Yeah. I'm sorry that I couldn't sneak by there uh, while we were down in Dallas. It was wide open, man. Uh, it was an amazing week, though. I learned a lot and. Ryan McGee and I had the great opportunity to interview all 16 head coaches in the league at length, uh, you know, 20, 20 or so minute interviews, a bunch of players, uh, a bunch of quarterbacks, Milrow and Ewers and Beck. We interviewed uh, Harold Perkins, Luther Burden, on and on, Connor Mace. We interviewed a lot of guys that uh, will be key contributors this year in the league. And so, uh, it was a very busy week, plus a lot of radio, and I'm just sorry I didn't get down there to you guys. So thrilled all, to be with you today. All good, man. I'm happy to have you on the program. Uh, by the way, Sideline CEO came out about a year ago now, right? Am I right about that? Right at. Yep. Great great book, man. You did awesome with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's done very well, and I'm really fulfilled by the opportunity to share that messaging with other people on the speaking circuit, doing a lot of uh, public speaking and motivational speaking. Uh, at leadership conferences all over the place based on the wisdom that I learned in that book. So, yep, if you uh, if you want to learn a lot about leadership, go get it. It's good. Hey, uh, let's talk about A&M's leadership. So you you actually spoke to Jimbo last year for that book. Now you got Mike Elko. Talk to yep. me about, and you spoke to him last week in Dallas. Tell me what you learned about him. What do you think? Uh, what are your initial thoughts? Very measured leader and a, a quiet intensity. And I think in College Station, that's probably welcome right now based on how the last couple of years have gone with all the tumult over the constant, constant analysis of how Jimbo was really doing. And I will sit here right now. I, Jimbo Fisher's a good football coach. Just didn't work. Just wasn't working. And so bringing Mike in as someone who – instantly flipped a culture there, there's a different energy uh it seems down there now and i appreciate his approach he was uh he understands the 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 overall culture down there having been on on jimbo's staff and won some really big games down there while he was dc he goes over to duke and does a very good job there as well and comes back and i think it's i would use that word measured measured but intentional and it certainly seems the players have gravitated to that difference in approach and when you're opening with notre dame at kyle field there's an urgency i think in camp too and so i think everybody's going to be extremely focused on being intentional with one another uh to be a a, a genuine team and not have fractures uh, with personalities. You don't have to like everybody, but when it's time to get between the lines on Saturday afternoons or evenings, you have to have that cohesion. And I believe that Mike's tutelage and wisdom and leadership uh, will will afford that from the jump. I mean, talking to players in Dallas, it's certainly – I know everybody's happy in July. Everybody's optimistic in mid-July. But – I think there's uh, there's reason for tremendous optimism. Talking to Marty Smith here on Texags Radio. So a lot of your colleagues, Jordan Rogers especially, are very high on Connor Wigman. Small sample set, but 19 and two. We'll take those numbers. And uh, he's only had one injury, but people kind of have labeled him with this injury bug because of the A and M quarterback situation over the years. What do you think about what you've seen from Connor? I think he's a great player, uh, and and. I would love to have seen how it unfolded had he been able to stay healthy last year. I mean, the numbers were very good. 
over that first several games. And when you when you have a guy like that coming back, who not only has shown that small sample size of very good play, but also has a, a bit of something to prove in his own mind, I think that's good. I think it's really good. I mean, I, I like the skill players around him. I think the running backs are good. Even though you lost a lot on the perimeter, I think what's what's there on the perimeter is good. And so, look, I, I'm very high on him too. And if Jordan – Jordan knows what he's talking about. I mean, he is brilliant at quarterback analytics and and seeing the way – the uh, the total package for the for the position. It's not just can you rip it. A lot of guys can rip it, but there's so much more involved in it. And I really like him. I, I hope he stays healthy. I don't know that it, you know the injury thing is is often unfair. It's it's not like he's a fragile player. Uh, if that's a narrative, I think it's a it's an unfair one. Marty, that first weekend. A&M, Notre Dame, that's just one of the games. You've got Clemson, Georgia, Miami, and Florida. What a great way to kick off this season. Uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I can't wait, man. I'm kind of chomping at the bit. We're getting to that place where we're getting on towards the 1st of August and camps are going to be starting and we're really going to be playing football. All the talking's done. And the league this year is is asinine. If you just for, – for, from from the start to the finish – the schedules are so unrelenting for so many of these teams. We were looking at Georgia's. You know, I think a, a lot of us look at Georgia as the standard by which everyone will be measured as we enter the season anyway. So much talent, so much depth. Kirby's arguably the best coach in the country. And so you, you look at the total package in Athens, and, and they look to be the team to beat. A lot of people are very high on Texas. As well, I'm a humongous fan of Steve Sarkeesian. I was thoroughly impressed with Quinn Ewers. I'd not met him before last week or whenever we were there. Was that last week? Yeah, last Two week. weeks ago, whenever it was. Uh, thoroughly impressed with him, just his his presence. And it, it's interesting when you – the first question that I asked him when I sat when we sat down with Quinn was, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but what I witnessed from the outside, from someone who hasn't been in your locker room or, or understand, uh, you know how you, your modus operandi as a person, what I saw happen was someone who decided to stop being a brand and start being a quarterback, and he kind of grinned and because if you just look at the difference in the way he's viewed, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, he went from the mullet and the you know viral TikTok arm angle videos and the whole thing to beating Alabama on the road and being a great leader and continually managing with great grace uh, all the all the buzz around uh, him and and Manning, and so thoroughly impressed with that kid. But their schedule is brutal. Georgia's schedule is brutal. It, you look at what these the teams these folks have to beat just to get to the championship game. No more divisions. So you're either going to be great for an entire season, maybe lose one, or you may not have the opportunity to fulfill the promise of the team. Marty, I, I look at this expanded playoffs and the expanded conferences that I wonder over the next few years, are we going to have to reevaluate what we consider elite teams because of what you just said I think Texas and Missouri have really easy-ish schedules compared to what Oklahoma and Georgia and even I would say A and M. You know, Florida's. it's not a hardest schedule. Have you looked at Florida's? Florida's is ridiculous. It's the hardest it's in the country. Just, it's just not even fair for Billy Napier and his guys. That that opening game uh, with the U in Gainesville will be there uh, with SEC Nation and Marty and McGee. That's where we're going to go week one. That I mean, Billy Napier needs that game like he needs oxygen, mm -hmm. and the same goes for Mario Cristobal. I mean, those those guys both for the trajectories of their programs really need that win, and it's there's a tremendous sense of urgency from the absolute go. And so, yes, to your to your point, with the college football playoff, and that was a big fear as this thing initially opened years ago. Are we going to 
rewrite what good is? Are we going to rewrite what acceptable is? Well, how has that evolved? The answer is yes. Because, you know, Georgia beat the brakes off of Florida State last year after both teams missed the college football playoff. And I don't think that's an indictment against Florida State at all because when these these teams have great seasons and then they don't make the playoff, a lot of young people decide what's best for their future is, I don't think I'm going to play in this game. And if you don't make the pl- – the playoff is – can be a skewed barometer of success. And now that we go to 12 – it creates more opportunity for more teams, but there's going to be some really good teams that don't make it. That doesn't mean they had a bad year. Marty, going back to Florida for a minute, you talked about that schedule and really that first month, the Miami game and the A&M game. They're looking at that as the two winnable games on that schedule, which tells you how ridiculous it's going to be and why I think if you're A&M, you kind of hope they beat Miami because and you know you don't want to take on a, a desperate team there in week three. And, and that's going to be, I mean, that's in Gainesville as well. It's going to be 200,000 degrees, even though those, you know, the A&M kids are used to that. But it's just merciless as you look through it. And, and fans of other conferences sort of mock the way that those of us who are really entrenched in the SEC discuss that gauntlet. Because, I mean, the Big Ten, a lot of the Big Ten schedules for these teams are very difficult as well. But, it, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't envy what Billy Napier has ahead. Uh, I, I enjoy very much spending time with him. Every time I sit down with him, I learn, and that happened again at SEC Media Days this year. But, the, I mean, there's a lot of noise down in Gainesville. Talking to Marty Smith here on Texas Radio. One thing that I found interesting last week, Marty, was that Alabama seemed like – I don't know, like the fifth storyline that people got to, right? Like yeah. this is an Alabama team that has a brand new head coach who, by the way, was in the national championship game last year, has won at every level. And Jalen Milrow was huge towards the end of last season, yet it was very quiet when it comes to Crimson Tide standards. I, I can't wait to see how Kalen DeBoer and his staff further develop Jalen Milrow at that position because – I don't think Tommy Reese and those guys got enough credit last year. Uh, early in the season, of course, uh, Milrow was erratic, gets benched, comes back, and was a completely different player after he watched that South Florida game. I did, I think, two college game day features on that very thing, but you against Texas A&M. I mean, if you go back and watch tape of Jalen Milrow last year against A&M, he was throwing receivers open in that game. It was an extremely impressive performance throwing the football. And that's when I think the narrative really changed for him. And I'll never forget, one, one of the most meaningful moments I had in 2023 was after the SEC championship game, chatting with Milro on the field in the moment of that energy and that euphoria and him breaking him him getting very emotional. I mean, he broke down in tears and I, I asked him, what is this emotion? And he said, everybody gave up on me. Everybody gave up on me, but I did not give up on myself. And I was able to bring my team to the sec mountaintop and the college football playoff. And they had an opportunity to beat Michigan in the Rose bowl. They didn't, but they had an opportunity to, and I don't know that a whole lot of people when we kicked off a year ago thought that that Alabama Crimson Tide team would do that. Marty, let's close out with this because we mentioned Jalen Milrow, Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers. Those are all the top tier, but you got all these other quarterbacks that are trying to vibe for a position. Nico is getting a lot of buzz. We already mentioned Connor Wigman getting some buzz. There's a lot of quarterbacks, Garrett Nussmeyer. We're going we're gonna to learn about who the new top tier is. We are, and and I I think that Nico, just my goodness, you just turn on the tape with that guy, and you talk to to Heupel about him, and you you talk to his teammates about him. Uh, they love the guy, and and I know that optimism in Knoxville is is at a fever pitch, because you have that kind of talent behind center and a lot of talent around him, 
and a great offensive system that gives people fits. Uh, I don't think that that Nussmeyer is – I mean, that guy's ready to go. He is plug and play. Any time that he's been called on, he has played at a very high level. He can really rip it. And I, I think the BK, uh, Brian Kelly's very high on him too. And that's, I mean, it's, there's so many good, good quarterbacks in the league, even at Florida, you know, you got a, you got a veteran coming back in Mertz. I mean, a really seasoned player. And I know that Billy's happy about that. So you're right. There, there are the, the names that everybody's talking about, but I think the vast majority of the teams, as long as they can keep them healthy, have a guy who can do really special things and they have to, man, they just have to, that, that position is so vital in the overall engine, if you don't have a guy who can beat you in myriad ways and, and really diagnose the, the, the league's just too hard. It's just too hard. If you don't have a stud, Marty, that hat is fire, man. Where'd you get it? Well, uh, I have a buddy who uh, has a hat company and he made it for me. I wear it all the time. And everybody asks me, where did you get that hat? So I've told that buddy, man, you need to start a business right now. Yeah, it is fire. I well, can't lie. Well, if he does start a business, let me know because I, I I'll, I'll one, send right? you one, bro. You got it, man. Hey, thank but we you. can't cover that hair up, man. Dude, I got this it, ball spot in the back. We got to cover something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate you having me always, man. You guys have a great day. I can't wait to get down there and see y'all.